pray. Oh Lord, we seek you. We seek your face to shine upon us in your glorious, holy grace. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's sermon is Heaven on Earth. And I want to begin by asking you to ask yourself. Where am I looking to know who Jesus is? I mean, honestly, do an assessment. Where are you looking to know who Jesus is? Where am I looking to know why Jesus came and to know his mission and his message, his gospel? Let me change the focus a little bit. Where am I looking? Ask yourself this. Where am I looking to know who I am? This is a driving question for teenagers, for young adults, for parents who are trying to guide teenagers and young adults. Identity issues, direction issues. Why am I here? Who am I? What am I going to be? What am I now? Why am I here? What direction should I take? What should I study? What should I do? Whom should I date? All those kind of things. What direction am I going to take? Well, today, I'm going to be inviting you, by the grace of God, to look to God, to look to heaven for the answers to these questions, and ultimately, the way God came to earth incarnate in Jesus Christ, who manifested the fullness of his glory, as we're going to see. So our scripture for today, we've circled around most of this scripture for a couple of, actually three Sundays now, the first segment of it, and now we're going to move on to Luke's account of what would be called the transfiguration in verses 28 and following. But we're going to be reading today the full segment of scriptures here, Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 36. So hear now God's word. And it happened while he was praying in private, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has arisen. Then he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. But he rebuked and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, it is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed and on the third day to be raised. And he said to all, in other words, the larger group of disciples, not just the 12, to all, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a person to acquire the whole world, yet himself destroy or forfeit? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, and that of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he, taking Peter and John and James, went up on the mountain to pray. And it happened while he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed and his clothing became white as lightning. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, 
who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him had been heavy with sleep, but having awakened fully, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And it happened while the men were departing from him, Peter, not knowing what he was saying, said to Jesus, Master, it is a good thing that we are here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. I don't know if you keep up with the Wall Street Journal, but the digital version posted an article last Sunday night late, and it was in the printed version on Monday. So I thought I would share it with you. Uh, that it's by a uh, Chinese correspondent uh, with the Wall Street Journal, Wei Lun Sun, and it's, the title is this. New Orleans-style wings are a global sensation, just not in New Orleans. The story goes on to talk about Alan Lee, a 30-year-old Beijing resident who became hooked on New Orleans-style chicken wings. You all know about New Orleans-style chicken wings, obviously. Any of you ever been to New Orleans? He became hooked on these things about 12 years ago, and as he went through university and then now as a young adult, he treats himself at least once or twice a week to New Orleans-style chicken wings. There's, they're, they're the greatest, hottest thing, pardon the pun, in Beijing. But then came a bombshell. Some of Lee's friends actually visited the United States, and some of them apparently went to New Orleans, and guess what? You know the answer to this, right? Are there New Orleans-style chicken wings at every corner in New Orleans the way Alan Lee thought? No. New Orleans people are like, what are you talking about? New Orleans-style chicken wings. This turns out to be a culinary you know, concoction and marketing craze that the Chinese and the People's Republic of China created. And all the Chinese think, well, to, to keep up with America, we've got to eat New Orleans-style chicken wings. Uh, the problem is they don't actually exist in New Orleans. New Orleans is famous for all kinds of food, but not its New Orleans-style chicken wings. That's not what you go to restaurants in New Orleans to eat. But this is along the same line of Hawaiian pizza. Does Hawaiian pizza come from Hawaii? No, it was concocted as a marketing deal in Canada. Canada, Hawaiian-style pizza. Swedish meatballs. Where did they come from? They came out of Turkey, the nation of Turkey. Um, General Zhao's chicken that all kinds of Americans think they have to eat at Chinese restaurants. If you went to Beijing, are you going to find that there? No, because that's an American concoction. In other words, people who don't actually know the real thing try to create their own version of what the real thing ought to be and sell it to others. We like to buy counterfeits and we rush to counterfeits instead of the real thing over and over again. This is the story all through the Bible and it's the story all the way to New Orleans style chicken wings being sold uh, crazily in Beijing, China. Unfortunately, on a more serious note, many people's versions of God, heaven, and Jesus are about as valid as Beijing's version of New Orleans-style chicken wings. Many people's versions of who they are. Am I a man? Am I a woman? Am I this or that? I mean, it's based on my creative personal ideas and maybe what people are marketing to me over social media these days 
instead of the reality. Why am I here? Where am I headed? Again, I can sell you some Swedish meatballs from Turkey and I can make money off it and you can be stupidly happy for the rest of your life not understanding that you're buying into a counterfeit. Now, on a kind of mid-level serious note, uh, let me commend to you, this is to adults or like really older teenagers and college students, uh, the new documentary that just came out a couple weeks ago, Beyond Utopia. Madeline Gavin is the director. It's released by Independent Lens Films. It came out a couple weeks ago. And it tells an amazing story about Pastor Sun Yoon Kim of Caleb Mission Church in Seoul, South Korea, and other South Koreans, most of them Christian, many of them Christian pastors, who've been involved in trying to rescue people who are attempting to escape from the brutal totalitarian regime of North Korea. There's no recreations in this documentary. Everything is actual, you know, real documentary footage. It's incredible. I mean, it's powerful. It, it, it gets your heart. Uh, the focus is on North Korean propaganda, which is basically an antichrist religion. As some of the folks in, uh, you know, narrating say, the regime told us we were living in utopia in North Korea. Um, but imagine one day waking up and realizing the heroes you had worshipped all your life were monstrous villains. Barbara Dimmick in the film notes that North Korea has basically plagiarized the Bible, or what she calls the Christian Bible. The founder of the dynasty, Kim Sung, supposedly was able to turn sand into rice. You know, like Jesus could have turned stones into bread, and like Jesus did turn water into wine. So they, the North Koreans just picked all up on this, and their great leaders, whoever the great leader is, can do all these kind of miracles like this. The government teaches that Kim Sung could also walk on water. I wonder where they get that from. Um, the birth of his son, Kim Jong, was attended, according to the government's narrative, by a glorious shining star that drew you and me to understand that Kim Jong was the savior. It's no wonder that the government wants to keep the Bible out of the country because among other times, uh, other reasons, they plagiarized it and recreated it in this antichrist religion that runs there in North Korea. Now, you and I may not be brainwashed by the North Korean dynasty, but we are easily brainwashed, if we allow ourselves to be, to what's on the latest TikTok, you know, viral post, maybe what's on Fox News or MSNBC or whatever your political persuasion is. And what I want to ask you today is to get your focus off some of that stuff that's basically shifting sands from the earth and to look to the God of heaven for your answers to know who Jesus is, to know why he came, what's his mission, what's his message. Not somebody, somebody told me this, somebody told me that, and I got it third hand from somebody else. I mean, actually, to know from God. And to learn who you are. Ask yourself and seek from God to learn who I am. What I'm meant to be, why am I here? And what direction should I take both tomorrow and maybe for the rest of my life. We've been looking for the past couple of weeks at this issue of identification and who Jesus is. Who is Jesus and who is Jesus to me? And I've told you that the, the big question in all of history is who is Jesus? Even from an objective, even if you don't believe in the Christian faith, you would have to say, well, historically, the most significant character, if you're an objective historian, who turned all of history is this Jesus guy. Who is he? But spiritually, our question is, who is Jesus to me? That's in particularly focused on last week's sermon, Jesus Gets Personal. We see and we've seen this building issue in Luke chapters 4 through 9, covering the first year and a half or so of Jesus' public ministry. Who is this Jesus? Who's this who's able to do all this stuff? Why is he here? What's he up to? We've already been told, right, in the early chapters of Luke. But now the question is, 
will the followers of Jesus, not the angels from heaven, not the demons from hell, I mean, they understand who Jesus is, both sides, they understand who Jesus is, but will his disciples, like human beings, like you and me, actually come to know and affirm and give our lives, trust our lives to who he is? This is kind of the building issue. And Jesus is preparing ultimately for his exodus you know, in Jerusalem for his death, his sacrificial lamb death for us, his atoning work and, and for his resurrection. So as he looks to that, he wants to build up his people to understand. You know, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Mary Magdalene, these people are going to have to know who he is and, and live out his mission as he commissions us. So that's what's going on. We've kind of got the building issue in Luke 4 through 9. And we saw last week in Luke chapter 9 verses 18 through 26 the penultimate identification of Jesus and it's actually penultimate identifications. First of Jesus as the Christ who is the praying prophetic and imminent. In other words he's down here with us. He's real. He's with us. Imminent son of man. Not simply transcendent, but also imminent. Also, his mandated mission by God's word, which is, as Jesus tells them, you know, AIDS. I mean, it's, it's necessary. That's why that translation is important. It's necessary for him to suffer by God's word and God's will, to be rejected by the full range of the representatives on the Sanhedrin, to die and to be raised again. It also... The choice and way of his disciples, personally and publicly, to confess Jesus as God's Christ, but to do it knowing that he is the Christ who is the Son of Man, who must suffer and go through death that you and I might live, and his suffering, his rejection, his death, his resurrection, and then that we are called in turn to follow him. It's not just like, well, thank you, Jesus. Appreciate it from a distance. No, no, we're called to actually deny ourselves to die to ourselves daily and take up our cross and follow him. This is in last week's sermon, Jesus Gets Personal. Uh, just to finish off the notes from last week, remember the paradox in verses 24 through 26. The choice that each of us has between two ways of life. Jesus says there's basically two ways of life. To try to save yourself in other words, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to make myself live longer. I'm going to secure my future. To be your own God, that's one choice. Or to give yourself up and trust him as your savior. Jesus says there's two kinds of people. If you try to save yourself, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for me and give yourself to me, you'll be saved forever. It's your choice. Now, then we come to what we hit last week, and it's the transition to today. 9, verse 27. Jesus' prophecy and promise that some disciples will see God's kingdom before they die. There are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Some will see the kingdom of God. Let's pull back for a moment and reflect on the kingdom of God. What is God's kingdom? We'll come back to that. Where is it, and how can I see it and enter it? Which should be a question that you should be asking, I should be asking. How am I going to see God's kingdom and enter it? Well, Jesus tells us that it's come with him. Uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 21. See, the kingdom of God, behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom has come here with Christ coming. And then it turns out it's not just with his coming, but as he sends out people who are empowered in communion with him. So we're going to get to this in a couple of weeks, a few weeks. But when we come to Luke chapter 10 and Jesus, after having sent out initially the 12 apostles, now sends out 70 or 72 further disciples in addition to the 12, separate from the 12. He sends them out to go and heal and proclaim the gospel. And he says this. Look at this, chapter 10, verse 9. Heal the sick in it, in every city you come to, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. In other words, not just when Jesus is there, but when anybody who is truly connected with Jesus comes, the kingdom is also at hand. Okay? And then when there's this debate and when Jesus is being 
accused of being a demon because he's casting out demons. He says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then here's a statement. This is a major declaration from Jesus. The kingdom of God has come upon you. In other words, it is here now with me. Not, not, not qualified. It's here. Let's go back to something else that we need to talk about for a moment, which is the big picture of biblical theology about God's plan. And this is something that I've learned, including in, in the Revelation study, that I know a lot of Christians out there, or people who call themselves Christians out there, as well as even some people who are regularly in Bible study, tend to think that God's plan is for us to get into the escape hatch from earth to heaven, and that's the whole point of the Bible in Jesus. Well, that's not the case. That is not the case. Running in the Bible all the way from Genesis chapter 2, through Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we see this God coming to earth for communion with us in the creation. In Genesis chapter 2, when God has created Adam and Eve, does he zap them up occasionally, zap me up, Scotty, to heaven for communion with him? No, he is walking in the garden with them. The whole idea of the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies is God comes near on earth. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all that. And then we move to Revelation as we come to the great climax of the Bible in Revelation 21 and 22. And the heavenly city, what, we get sucked up to the heavenly city? No, the heavenly city comes down to the new earth. The new earth, not this earth, now recreated earth, okay? And there is no temple, as we said in the call to worship. We'll come back to that. But so God's plan is not for us to escape to heaven. A lot of Christians seem to think that. A lot of good Christians seem to think that. But for God to bring heaven and his kingdom where? You can fill in the blank now. Where? On earth. It's in your notes. Fill it in. Jesus teaches us to pray for and to seek the kingdom of heaven and God's will. Come on, Christians. Parents, hope you're teaching your children the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches us to pray for God's kingdom and God's will where? Just out there in the stratosphere somewhere? No, on earth as it is in heaven. But how can I see and enter this kingdom of God? Well, Jesus says that you must be typically translated born again. But the anothen there actually means from above. You'll see it in the footnotes with the ESV. You must be born from above, which is heaven interacting with somebody on earth. Jesus also says you must be born of the water and the spirit, otherwise you can't enter the kingdom. So you need to be born from above to see the kingdom, and you must be born of the water and the spirit to enter. A lot there, I'm not going to unpack that, that's a separate sermon. But it comes from God interacting with us here. Jesus also says more ominously that, look, if you've got anything in your life that is getting in the way of your having a living, vibrant relationship with God, you need to cut it out. You need to redirect your friendships, what you're doing with your time, what you're doing with your body. And he gives the Jewish hyperbole of saying, like, look, if your hand causes you to sin, cut off the hand. He says, if your eye is causing you to sin, if you're looking at the wrong stuff, if you're looking in the wrong direction, Tear out, pluck out your eye. Because he says this, it's better to enter God's kingdom, and this is back to how we enter the kingdom. He says it's better to enter God's kingdom with one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into hell. You've got to make some choices here. So back to the big question, who is Jesus? This is the building issue, as I've said, in chapters 4 through 9. And now we come to the ultimate identification. And it comes from no one less than God the Father himself. God's revelation of heaven on earth in Jesus. This this is my son, the chosen. And heaven on earth in Jesus' word. Altu akuite. It's a command. Hear him. And that means not just listen. That means actually hear and obey and remember his word and put it into practice. That's biblically what that means. 
So in other words, to know and to obey Jesus is heaven on earth. To know and to obey Jesus is heaven on earth. What is your most important thing you can do, teenager? What is your most important thing you can do, retired person? To know and obey Jesus by his word. So now it came to pass, uh, get that in there because the Ginnito, you've heard it from me a bunch of times with Luke, he uses it a lot, Ginnito, and it's, it's in this passage quite a bit. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he, Jesus taking Peter, John, and James. We've had the breakout of these three before with the raising of Jairus' daughter. We've got the breakout again, and this is a foretaste of what's going to happen at Gethsemane when he brings all 12, but then he breaks out Peter, John, and James. Notice the order, Peter first. John is younger than James, but John now is listed ahead of James. But this is the inner three. And he's going to take them, not just randomly, but to pray with him, just like in Gethsemane. Okay. Um, and he went on the mountain to pray. And it happened, another Ginnito there, while he was praying. Okay, go back to the New Year's Eve sermon, first pray, where I link all these different, it happens while Jesus is praying, baptism, etc., all the way through. And it happened while he was praying. Jesus' glorification comes in his what? How does his glorification, the outward manifestation of the essential truth of Jesus' glory, how and when does it come? Can you fill in that blank? Look back at the scripture. The glorification comes in Jesus' praying. You get heaven on earth when Jesus the Son is in prayer communion with the Father and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Is prayer something you check off on the list, or is it heaven on earth? If you're praying in Jesus, it's a little taste of heaven on earth. And this is what happens with the transfiguration. His glorification comes in his praying, in his prayer communion with his Father. It's heaven on earth. But notice this, whereas at the baptism, God's assuring and commissioning revelation is to Jesus as his Son, you're my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. The father, in, in the midst of Jesus' praying, communicates to Jesus. Notice where the communication is going to be directed this time. Jesus is praying, but notice this. The father's revelation in response to Jesus' prayer is not to Jesus, but fill in the blank, the three disciples who are with him. Peter, John, and James. Now I have a, a side note that's really important for you and me. The Bible tells us repeatedly that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And most of us think, and this is rightly a front burner issue, that Jesus is interceding for our forgiveness, okay? So we not only pray for our forgiveness and God's mercy in our lives and God's grace, Jesus is interceding for that. Father, she's with me, he's with me. See my righteousness in him, okay? But it's not just that. Think about this, what we just read. Jesus is also interceding so that you might hear the Father speaking to you. Isn't that awesome? Jesus is praying right now at the right hand of the Father that you would hear God speaking into you and into your life. It's incredible. I mean, what a gift, right? He's at the right hand of the Father right now, not just for forgiveness, but also for revelation to you and me. Now, back to the transfiguration. Flowing from this prayer communion with the Father, Jesus' face, uh, it was, the appearance was transformed, and his clothing became white as lightning. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, the figureheads of the law and the prophets, the two great prophetic figures of note, and Elijah's supposed to come again, you know, with the Messiah coming, and Moses, you know, the, the prophet like Moses kind of thing. A lot of prophecy going on here. They were speaking with Jesus about his exodus. I gave you that in the translation. I want to make sure you get this. In the Greek, it's exodus. It's translated typically departure. It's exodus. 
same term that's used as the title for the second book of the Bible, and you're all supposed to be circling around to Exodus, the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb, deliverance from death into life, deliverance from Egypt into the Promised Land, uh, the passing over of death, and also Exodus, the holy mountain where the cloud comes down on Mount Sinai, and the glory of the Lord is evident as God speaks to Moses. Well, now the glory of the Lord is gonna be evident by Jesus through Jesus on the mountain. You're supposed to get that, but his exodus coming up is gonna be his sacrificial death and his resurrection to deliver you from death to life. So he's talking with Moses and Elijah about this and being prepared for the next stage of his ministry, which is ultimately gonna be in Jerusalem and the cross and the resurrection. Um, the sleepy disciples wake up and they see Jesus' glory, the outward manifestation, as well as Moses and Elijah, but they kind of miss the whole point. God is showing them that this is heaven on earth in Jesus, specifically in Jesus. But Peter, God bless him, God bless you and me, rushes into all kinds of misinterpretation. First, we get the selfie moment. Hey, Jesus, it's awesome that, you, that we're here with you for this incredible moment. I've never gotten a selfie with Moses and Elijah and you together. Can we get one now, the whole group? And, hey, can we build a tabernacle? You know, hey, boss, you're up there at the high level. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Man, the three great prophets, right? Uh, no, Peter, you're kind of, uh, you're getting off on the edifice complex. What can I do? What can I build to capture this moment, this mountaintop moment? That's the way human beings, that's the way you and I tend to do, right? It's not the edifice complex, folks. It's a different thing going on here. It's all about Jesus. So the heavenly cloud, just like, uh, you know, at Mount Sinai, the heavenly cloud envelops them. The voice from the cloud, the Father says, and we're going to focus on this for a couple of minutes before we close. You've got to catch this. When God speaks, and there are two distinctive times in Luke uh, where God's going to speak directly about Jesus and what we're supposed to do. Here it is. The voice from the cloud. This is the Father, 935. This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. And then this is awesome. After that, verse 36, Jesus is alone. You want good, reformed, Protestant theology, Christ alone. There it is. It's not about Moses, not about Elijah, not about some tabernacle I'm building, not about some future temple, some physical temple. He is the temple. You get this? I mean, he is the presence of God on earth. This is heaven on earth. So this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Now notice the indicative leads to the imperative. You need to know this sequence to understand a lot in the New Testament. Paul uses it a lot. For instance, Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 is indicative about who Jesus is and who we are in him. And then chapter 4 onward is the imperative. What, is, what are we supposed to do? Given all that God is and what he's done for us in Jesus, what do we do? Indicative, imperative. Do you follow it? Here, it's really short and really simple. The indicative is, is this is my son, period. The chosen one. And the imperative is, Altu Akuate, listen to him. Be in his word. Don't listen to all those other people. Listen to him. Don't get distracted. Listen to him. Who he is, who we are, and what we're to do. The indicative, the imperative. And God's word tells us over and over again, we're supposed to live in his word. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ live in you richly. Is the word of Christ living in you richly? I'm not giving you a guilt trip. I'm just inviting you into a new way of living, to live in the word richly. Psalm 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Come on Wednesday night. Let us equip you. This Wednesday night, a little bit more growth. Wherever you are, even if you're just starting to try to figure out, well, how can I read the Bible? How can I read the Bible every day? But I'll, I'll refer to Andrew Davis, How to Memorize Scripture for Life. If you're kind of beyond, like if you started to crack the book, We'll get you equipped in that. Heaven on earth. And then looking ahead again to Revelation 21. The new Jerusalem, the heavenly city comes down to earth. Heaven on earth. And Revelation 21 says, look, see, God's tabernacle is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. Are we looking for a physical temple? No. It goes on to say there is no temple. There's no sun. There's no created light. For the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the lamb and the nation shall walk by its light so here's the good news even now jesus has come 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling with us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only come from the father full of grace and truth. John 1.14, we live on this side of that. We believe in Jesus. And so as Paul says in Philippians 2, walk as children of the light because you are the light. In other words, if you have received Jesus, you yourself become light to the world around you. This week, the people you meet, may Christ's light shine through you. And then celebrate, Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine. Literally, arise, be light yourself, because your light, Jesus, has come. And the Lord's glory has risen upon you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.